Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we praise you. There is no one like you. In your greatness and in your glory and just as evidenced as we remember the incarnation, we magnify you. We rejoice in you, our God, our Savior. You look upon our need, our humility, and we bless you, you who are mighty and you've done great things for us. Holy is your name. Your mercy is on those who fear you from generation to generation. You have shown your strength with your arm. You have scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. You've brought down the mighty from their thrones and you've exalted those of humble estate. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you have sent away empty. You've helped your servant Israel. You have come for the salvation of your church and the remembrance of your mercy as you spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. As you raised up for us a horn of salvation in the house of David, your servant, that spoke by the prophets of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy promised to our fathers and to remember your holy covenant, this oath that you swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve you without fear in holiness and righteousness before you all our days. And so we thank you that you have given the knowledge of salvation to your people, that we might have forgiveness because of your tender mercy. This is all because of the cross. This is all because of the death of your son. It's because of him and what he has done. That's why we're here. That's why we're gathered around your word and the gospel. And that's why we worship and praise you. And so stir up afresh in our hearts our sin. Bring us out to the open where we might confess and find mercy before you. And be assured in this grace that we would walk in obedience to this one who first loved us. You who has beckoned us back to yourself. To the glory of Christ in your church we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And as you get comfortable there, make your way in a Bible to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. We're continuing our study in the exposition of Genesis, going really verse by verse, chapter by chapter, working through the book. And we looked at last time, of course, the fall, the beginning of this with man's disobedience to God. And now we turn to see the ramifications of this. And what we're going to see is ultimately the confession, the confession of man or a sort of confession. At least God seeking him, pursuing him, that he might confess. But of course, man in his sin is less than willing to just put himself out there, as we'll find. Because we're dealing with confession, we're dealing with forgiveness, or in a word that we use in a more common vernacular would just be an apology, is where this really begins. Have you ever heard of the non-apology apology? Apology. Or have you ever received one before? And it can be painful. So let me say now I'm sorry if you might be offended with what I'm about to say about this. One definition I found from the non-apology apology apology explained it this way, quote, a non-apology apology is a statement that has the form of an apology, but does not express the expected remorse. It commonly entails the speaker saying that he or she is sorry, not for a behavior, statement, or misdeed, but rather is sorry only because a person who has been aggrieved is requesting the apology. Is this still foggy for you, what the non-apology apology is, especially if we're prone to use it? It's hard to see it. Let me give you a couple examples. One category would be the mistakes were made. That can be a useful phrase for one looking to make a non-apology apology. When a leader or official makes the comment that mistakes were made, the fact of wrongdoing has at least been acknowledged, right? But apparently there's no one responsible. At least it wasn't them. What kind of apology is this? Or another category of the non-apology apology is the so-called if apology. I'm ashamed to say I've used this one many times. The statement typically at least offers some personal association, I'm sorry. But then the statement is added immediately afterward, effectively negating any real remorse or recognition of wrongdoing. I'm sorry if you were offended by this, if you were offended by what I said. If you think about it, the if apology, it's quite a maneuver, isn't it? 
For not only have you dodged any real recognition of wrongdoing, we're also effectively accusing wrongdoing of the one offended, that they're too thin-skinned, that they're too hypersensitive. So why does the non-apology apology exist? Writing for the Los Angeles Times, Brendan Tapley ponders this and he asks, so why have apologies, if they can do so much good, which is why we even feel compelled to make a non-apology apology, if they do so much good, he says, why do we have a, such a hard time extending them? That is an apology. And he offers this answer. He says, an admission of guilt is something to avoid in a world strident about self-esteem. Undertaking an apology, after all, requires first feeling bad about oneself, end quote. To really apologize, to really ask for forgiveness, we must confess wrongdoing. We must confess our sin. And when we do this, we are admitting that we are guilty. And being found guilty, being found to be a sinner, is a scary place to be. We know this, and so we try and frame it differently. We try and cover ourselves. We try and dodge this guilt so the condemnation, the consequences don't stick. And of course, our tendency to do this, the non-apology apology type thing, this isn't anything new. And this started all the way back in the very beginning with the first sinners, which is where we now turn in Genesis 3, verses 8 to 13. We're going to uncover here in this text our tendency as sinners, how we respond to God when we're confronted as sinners. We flee, we avoid, we excuse, we blame shift. But we'll also consider the great mercy of God, his overwhelming mercy that even though we're running from him, we're trying to hide from him, he doesn't let it slide. And it's not just so simply that he can judge us. He doesn't let it slide because he's coming to give us mercy. He's coming to draw us out that we might find forgiveness. So he calls us out to the light where, yes, our sin is revealed, and that's a scary thing, but even what's more revealed is his abundant mercy. That's only found if we come to the light, if we come humbly confessing and repenting. The main idea this morning as we look in Genesis 3, 8 through 13, is this. Don't hide. Don't ignore. Don't cover up your sin. Because understand, God invites you to come to him, which means coming out in the open, coming out from hiding, coming out from behind our facade of self-righteousness and humbly confessing, owning our sin, owning our disobedience, because that's where we can finally find mercy in this God who is a God of grace, this God who forgives sinners because of what his son has done. So we're going to see this as we look at Genesis 3. And the first thing we're going to see as sinners is this. As sinners, we want to avoid God, but God still pursues us. We want to avoid God. We want to hide from him because we're sinners. And we know there's justice. We know there's condemnation. We know there's consequences that we've engaged from our disobedience. But God still pursues us. As we already mentioned, he's pursuing us in mercy. As we look at our first mother and father here in the text of Genesis 3, we see how the first sinners, how they handled this new reality that they discovered about themselves. They are guilty. They are sinners. They are naked and exposed. They've become aware that they have severed this relationship with God. And so they want to avoid him, but he mercifully still pursues Let's see that first with man's response here. We see the man and his wife hide from God, trying to avoid God at all costs. Genesis 3, 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So again, setting the stage where we were, where we were last week, man has just sinned. Just for this, just before this. And he's tried to cover himself up. Remember that he was making a loincloth, a a belt-like covering of fig leaves. And as he is caught in his disobedience, God walks into the room, into the garden, literally. And God's coming into the garden to, as he would daily, 
mentions in the text, the cool of the day. This seemed to be that special time when God entered the garden to have fellowship, to have relationship with this one that he has made, his image bearers, those that, who were created to have fellowship with him. It seems to be a regular occurrence. So at the beginning of verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That was ordinary. That was normal in a pre-sin world where God fellowships with his people. But the response of Adam and Eve is anything but ordinary. This is strange in the history of man so far. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. With the sound of God drawing near, suddenly Adam and Eve's mind were apparently flooded with this realization. We disobeyed this God who is coming. And they remembered, he warned us, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So they hide. They try and avoid the reality. This confrontation with God. Now, what they should have known and what we've seen already about God in Genesis, let alone as we think about the whole Bible, isn't this rather foolish based on what we know about God trying to hide from him? I mean, what do we know about our God? He's omniscient, meaning he is all-knowing. 1 John 3.20 says just plainly that God knows everything. Can we hide from this God? Can we dupe a God who is like this? Maybe he won't notice our new loincloths? He already knows. What else do we know about God? He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. Right? So how can you hide from a God like that? A God like described in Psalm 139. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Wherever we may run to go hide, he knows. And he's already there. Tag, you're it. But before we scoff at Adam and Eve's stupidity, remember, they're new to this whole sinning bit. We have a lot of practice. We have a lot of practice at sin, and we have a lot of practice at trying to cover it up before others. They're new at this, and so they respond like a young child who's done wrong, doing what they can just immediately think of to try and cover it up. But we as parents, right, experienced sinners, we see right through it. All right. Come out from behind the kitchen counter. Tell me why you are reaching on the top shelf for the cookie jar, which I told you not to take from, right? But we do the same thing. We try and avoid the consequences of our sin. Like I said, we've just become more practiced or more sophisticated about it. We lie. I didn't do that. I didn't get angry. We minimize. I didn't do anything too bad. I didn't get that angry. Or we blame shift. It wasn't my fault. You should have seen what he did to me first. We ignore. I don't know what you're talking about. When was I angry? We redefine. Well, see, that wasn't the bad thing you think it was. Again, I I wasn't angry. I was just frustrated, concerned. I was just being stern, not angry. Much different. Of course, none of this works on God. None of it fools him. Nothing gets by him. All of our attempts to hide are vain. He knows, he sees, he will find you out. But as he finds us out, we see that he pursues us, but in mercy. The Lord God searches and draws out the man. We see here that God indeed goes to pursue Adam... In in our disobedience, we fear, right? Because we fear the consequences of disobedience. But the tenor, the the theme of God's arrival here into the garden and of his search for Adam, it might surprise you here. God doesn't simply just barge into the garden as judge and jury looking to execute the judgment as soon as possible. Now, the Lord God mercifully calls Adam out. He's calling him out to the open. He's calling him out back to him. Look there, verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Though we've wrecked this relationship with God, and now we must relate to God as our condemning judge, we've engaged that. 
But we've misunderstood the character of our God. If we think that brute, brute justice is his first impulse. God is not going to simply just let Adam out of this relationship and give Adam over to sin and death because God is a God of grace. He's a merciful God. He's going to make the best of what remains of this wrecked relationship. And he mercifully draws Adam out with a gracious word. Where are you? I want to see you. I want to know where you are. I want to speak with you. I know you're hiding from me. I know you've done wrong. But I still want a relationship with you. I still love you. Come back to me. Is it not one of the great deceptions of the devil that we, because of our sin, hide from God and run from him? Him who is the only one who can actually forgive us? We're running from the very solution, the only solution there is, mercy at the feet of God. Beyond our hiding is vain. He invites us back if we will just humble ourselves and come. And why is this? Because our God, yes, he's a God of justice. We'll look at this more next week. But he's also a God of mercy. And that's even his first step. And so man does come out. He comes out of hiding. And let's hear man's rationale for his behavior. He admits to fear and shame, though not exactly sin. He comes out of hiding. Here man tries to explain himself there in verse 10. And he said, this is Adam, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Adam reveals why he hid himself from God. He says, I was afraid. He was afraid. Which fearing God is a good thing generally, right? I mean, Proverbs indeed, the very theme of the book is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yet, of course, this kind of fear is a change. This is something new. This is the fear, the terror, the realization that God, our Almighty, has and will judge us. And as He does, He will find us guilty. This is the kind of fear that results once the relationship of love has been broken, which is what we've done with our sin. Right? 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has nothing to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. That's this kind of fear. So now, because Adam has sinned, he anticipates the punishment for sin. And he's rightly afraid. But rather curiously, as we continue, Adam, he doesn't just give his sin as the explanation for his fear. He doesn't say, I'm afraid because I'm a sinner. He says, rather, I was afraid because I was naked. Naked is his explanation for fear. Now, th this is, should surprise us, at least for a couple reasons. First of all, until just a few moments ago, right, Adam had literally been naked his whole life. God had made him naked. And theretofore, he had only known God or been in his presence as naked. So why now would he fear God in his nakedness? And second to that, wasn't Adam clothed now anyway? Remember, what did he do immediately? They made loincloths. He was covered. In quite a literal sense, they were not naked. Well, we touched on this last time. There's more here to nakedness than physical, physical coverings or any lack thereof. This nakedness pictures shame before God, pictures their guilt. Their rebellion is exposed. Recall those words, those last words of Genesis 2, speaking about the man and the woman. It says that the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. They had a fully open, sharing relationship with one another, physically and otherwise. There was no shame in being fully known. There was nothing to hide. But now with God, there is shame. There is something to hide. The relationship is broken. There is guilt. They've exposed themselves and now they are before him seen for what they are, sinful rebels. And this is evident. As God approaches, what does man do? He hides. 
But even in, in his explanation, Adam has unwittingly shown his hand in mentioning his nakedness, showing that he indeed is disobedient, that he has crossed God's boundary, that he is guilty. But Adam has yet to bring himself to admit his sin, to really confess. But mercifully, God still pursues him. God still goes after him. And he draws and invites Adam out to the open to find confession and find forgiveness, which is what we see here next. As we as sinners are confronted with this holy God, we continue to run. We make excuses. We can't deny that we're sinners, but we excuse it. But God invites us back into full confession, full disclosure. Because then we'll see it's so he can give us full mercy. So we see that God's reflex response to our sin, so to speak, is not simply swift justice, but it's mercy. It's a pursuing of reconciliation and relationship. And yet as sinners, we still don't want to come out in the open, even though he's being kind and talking to us. We still try and make excuses. All the while, God is still inviting us back to himself. So we see here first, the Lord God draws out the man. In verse 11, he draws out the man for confession. Verse 11. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? So in response to Adam and his explanation about his hiding, God poses a couple questions. Now again, we keep in mind who here is asking the questions. God. What does God know? Everything. Everything. Does he already know Adam's answer? Does he already know the truth behind why why Adam is hiding? Absolutely. Are these questions to fill in God's body of knowledge? No. Who are these questions for? For Adam. God knows the answer. He doesn't need to have an investigation to figure out the solution to his questions. He knows them. He is leading Adam somewhere. And where he's leading him, he's drawing Adam out back to him. He's drawing him to a confession, an admission, an agreement with God that he has indeed disobeyed him. That is, before sin can ever get dealt with between us and God or even between one another, the sin that's now separating or fracturing the relationship, this wedge that's being pushed between us and separating us, before the sin can be dealt with, it has to be identified. It must be acknowledged. It must be owned. This is humbling. It's humiliating even. It's shameful. But it's necessary. If our sin would be dealt with, it must be identified, acknowledged. Then something, if it's possible, can be done about the sin. And this is true with Adam and Eve and with us and God. But this is true with our relationships with one another too. Whenever sin separates us from one another. You know, there are times where sin and offenses done between two people, they can be overlooked. They can be graciously ignored. Like we read about in Proverbs 19.11, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it's his glory to overlook an offense. But other times, the trespass or offense is too big too evil, too disruptive to be simply overlooked. It needs to be dealt with. It needs to be addressed. So when a sin has separated two in a relationship, two things need to take place. This is what we see coming out here in Genesis. In the first, there needs to be a confession. There must be confession. There must be a clear acknowledgement and identification of the sin by the one who committed it. We recognize this, that this is much different than saying, I'm sorry, you're offended. That's not owning our sin. That's not confession. There's, there's no admission of wrongdoing there. There must be an identification of sin for what it really is, sin, disobedience to God and an affront to those whom we've sinned against. And implied in this confession is the 
acknowledgement, not only of the sin, but a commitment to turn from it, repentance. We saw this in Luke 17, didn't we? In the story that Rich was just sharing about us, when our brother comes to us and says, I repent, you give, forgive them 70 times seven. There's a commitment to say, I'm not only sorry, but I'm turning from this. By God's help, I'm not going to do this again. To clearly confess our sin to one another, we don't just say, I'm sorry. We say, I sinned against you. And then identify the sin. Don't just leave it at this blanket statement, yes, I'm an evil person. Yeah, we all are, especially in this, as we understand a, a theologically astute congregation. Yeah, everybody's a sinner. I am a sinner. No, you need to do more than this in your relationship with one another. You need to say, yes, I'm a sinner, and I sinned against you in this way. This helps a ton. Helps a ton for us to deal with our own sin in our heart, let alone with one another. I sinned against you when I raised my voice in anger. Or I sinned against you when I selfishly ignored whatever your request was. Because then once the sin is out there, then you can actually deal with it. And the way it gets dealt with in relationship is hopefully forgiveness. That's the other thing that must take place when a sin has put a wedge between us. There needs to be confession, but there also needs to be forgiveness. That's how the sin gets dealt with. That's the way we deal with our sin. We restore the relationship, and that happens to or through forgiveness. Forgiveness is when you release the debt. You're releasing the offender from this debt, this obligation of the guilt that they now have, that they have against you or have done against you. So when the sin's forgiven, it's covered, it's released out of that obligation. It's put out of the way. The thing that was being wedged and separating you is removed as you've forgiven it. So let there then be a clear articulation or relationships with one another of forgiveness. If someone says, I sinned against you when I raised my voice in anger, don't just simply say, that's okay. As if that implies there's no wrongdoing. No, tell the humbled repenter who's come to you and say, I forgive you, brother. I forgive you. Let this not come between us. Because when we're saying, I forgive you, we're making a promise to that person. A threefold, threefold promise, as one pastor has helpfully said. We're promising these things. Number one, I will not bring up this offense again or use it against you. I will not bring this up again. We're making another promise to say, I will not bring it up to others and gossip. Or malign you because of it. That's what forgiveness looks like. And thirdly, we're making this promise, I will not bring it up to myself or dwell in the offense. It's one thing to say, yes, I forgive you. And then in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, but he's such a jerk. That's not forgiveness. You're still holding on to that thing. And though you've said to even them that that thing's removed, it's obviously still there, separating the two of you. But wow, that can be so hard. And especially the more serious the sin the harder it is to forgive. Because we understand that the more serious the sin, especially the closer the person is to us relationally, the greater the cost to us as the forgiver. Because as we forgive the debt, we're taking on ourselves. We're just taking on the pain and saying, I forgive you. This is hard. Again, what we saw in Luke 17, it's no wonder then that as the disciples hear about this kind of forgiveness, what do they then ask Jesus? Increase our faith. I don't know how to do that. But of course, what Christ is asking us to do is do what? In a small way, do what I've done for you. Forgive as I've forgiven you. Again, that doesn't make it easy, but that's where we start. Back to our text. We see God in his mercy working and starting to rebuild this relationship with Adam because he's trying to pull him out into the light, into confession. And we see here, the man's, and eventually the woman's as well, they're veiled, I've called it, confession. They're veiled confession. As we come to verse 12, Adam gives a confession of sorts. He admits the wrongdoing. He admits the sin. But we can plainly see that this confession is less than full ownership of the wrong. It's veiled. It's hard to even find the confession as it's surrounded by all of this 
other excuse and jargon. Look at verse 12. So as he draws him out, did you disobey? Did you do the one thing I commanded you not to do? Adam's response. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Okay, first of all, let's give our father Adam a little credit. He confessed his sin. He acknowledged his wrong. The very last thing he says is, and I ate. But of course, it's not so plain. In the original language, there's nine words of blame shifting and deflecting before you get to that one single word confession, I ate. So although he has come out in the open and he said the right words, I sinned, I ate, he's still trying to hide, isn't he? He's trying to hide behind others as this excuse for his behavior. Implicitly, he's saying, I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have done that if so-and-so didn't do this first. It's really their fault. They're, they're the ones you should be going after. They're the, they're the ones you should be upset with. Well, working backward, so we'll start with the confession, I sinned, and then working backward, who is Adam trying to hide behind? Well, of course, he brings up the woman, his wife. She gave me of the fruit of the tree. It's Eve's fault. It's my wife's fault. I can't be blamed. She tempted me. She just gave me that thing. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be in this mess. Some confession, huh? But the audacity of this guilt, of this guilty sinner, multiplies ten times as he just keeps talking. In the end, it wasn't really Eve's fault after all. Look how he describes the woman there. Verse 12, the woman, yeah, she's a part of this, whom you, God the Almighty, gave to be with me. Whose fault is it really? God's. It wasn't Eve's fault after all. It was God's. You gave me this wife, and now look what happened. I was going fine all by myself, and then now this, thanks to you. Oh, how foolish sin has made Adam become, right? Has he forgotten the goodness and generosity of God? I mean, where did the woman start? It all started because it was not good for Adam to be alone. So God graciously met the need, gave him this woman. And it wasn't as if when Adam saw his wife said, uh-oh, this is trouble. What did he say? At last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He breaks out in poetry. He's so overcome by this beauty, by this helper, by this companion. Blinded though now by his guilt, his eyes are now shut to reality. He cannot even see anymore the goodness and generosity of God. Because he's out to save his own skin. He's just thinking, how can I hide? How can I get out of this? You ever done that? Don't we do the same thing? Try and get out of the consequences? And we try to shift the blame elsewhere? Provide an excuse? Try and blame other people? Now son, listen. I wouldn't have gotten angry and yelled if you would just listen once in a while. I wouldn't have been such a jerk to you around here if you just, you know, help out and do something. We try and excuse our sin, our disobedience to Christ because someone's disobeyed, someone's dissatisfied us, someone's hurt us. Though certainly all those things, when people wrong us, when they tempt us, it can make obedience more difficult, no doubt. But it doesn't excuse us. We're still responsible. People don't make us sin. We choose to, and this makes us responsible, accountable, guilty. Sometimes we'll blame not people, but our situation or circumstances, just more generally. Well, if I had a job or, or if we were making more money, I wouldn't be so irritable to you. I just wouldn't be so short. I mean, you understand, right? If you'd been through what I'm going through now, you understand why I cursed at him or why I so often complain about this. And in the end, isn't this just 
a veiled attempt, not so well, at blaming God for our sins, which we mustn't ever do. James 1.13, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. And why not then? Where did the sinful temptation, the desire ultimately come from in our case? James 1.14, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Why do we sin? Why do we do the bad things we do? Each person is tempted and enticed by his own desire. Why? Because we want to. Because we want to. So there's no one else. There's no other thing. There's no circumstance to blame but us. And however Adam might try, God sees through his deceit. Adam will be held accountable for his, sin, for his sin. We see this as we look at verse 17. We'll look at this in more detail next week. But you see, God's addressing Adam. And look where he starts. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground. You're not fooling me, Adam. I know you sinned. Neither will we fool him. Our sin will find us out one way or another. And this is essentially the same pattern we see with Eve, isn't it? The Lord God draws out the wife's confession. Looking there, verse 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Again, having excuses in her deception. In the end, it just doesn't work. The excuses don't work. They don't really hide us from God. Because the great problem here for Adam and Eve, and every sinner who has now come afterward, which includes, of course, all of us in this room, we don't want to confess. We don't want to acknowledge our sin. Why? All kinds of reasons. Chiefly this, we fear God's justice. We fear His wrath. We fear his just judgment, and rightly so. But at this side of death, because we are all alive in this room, there is much more to fear in hiding our sin than there is in confessing it. Do you get that? There's more to fear in trying to hide and cover your sin than there is in actually bringing it out to the open. Because the greater tragedy is this. All of our attempts to hide from God, to try and hide our sin, they're keeping us from the only one who can deal with it. From that one who at the same time is inviting us back out of hiding. Though we're right to be fearful as sinners before a holy God, in the gospel we also hear a voice calling us out of hiding calling us out of the facade of religious self-righteousness, inviting us to confess, because there you can find mercy through Christ, through his death and resurrection. This is pictured so well for us in 1 John, verses 1 and 2. Or sorry, not verses, but chapters 1 and 2. 1 John 1, 8 reads this way. If we say we have no sin, either by blame shifting or covering in self-righteousness, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, agree with God what we've done, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, there it is. Forgiveness, cleansing, reconciliation, mercy, love, a relationship with God again. Praise him for this. comes through confession. And he's not writing this in 1 John to encourage more sin. So you can just ask forgiveness, right? He makes this clear as he continues. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. He's writing to curb, prevent, discourage sin. But he knows the reality of living as even a spirit indwelt Christian in a post-Genesis 3 world. He knows the reality of what it's like to live as a Christian, but one who's still a sinner. If anyone does sin, 
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And there it is. This invitation, just come. Don't hide in your sin any longer. Don't keep running from him until it's too late to have your sin dealt with. Don't keep trying to cover over your sin, distracting others, yourself, trying to fool God. The sin's not really there. That I'm not that bad. Because in the end, the more we pretend like we're not sinners, the more we pretend we like that we don't need a savior. And then we won't have one. Friends, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. So friends, why proudly pretend like you don't need a savior? When Christ is there, our righteous advocate, claiming us, interceding for us. Friends, why, why do we become so defensive when we're rebuked or criticized? Are we not a sinner? <laughs> is this new information to us? Shouldn't be, not if we're Christians. Because yes, our sin comes out in the open, but that casts us on the one that's greater than our sin, this advocate. So let's change. Let's change. Let's dig deep in our soul this week. Prayerfully uncover this week. Look at some sin, some disobedience in your life. Something you've been excusing, ignoring, that you're trying to cover up. Find the sin. And then turn in confession and find the Savior. And from there, we'll find mercy, assured mercy and forgiveness as we confess to God. And there we'll find assurance and power to change. But it starts with confessing. Let's pray that he would help us this week. Lord Jesus, we come to your merciful feet where you see all that we are exposed before you and before your word. And this is a terrifying place for us to be. But we rejoice that you have cast out all fear in your mercy if we look to you. And so we look afresh. We say, Lord Jesus, forgive us. Forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for our sins of anger, of lust, of hiding and confessing and lying and cheating and so many other things. But forgive us. And may we know the assurance of your forgiveness because of what you've done. And from this, may we walk, walk in obedience to you. Not pretending to be something we're not, but we're showing forth that we are sinners saved by your grace. It's for this we pray. Amen.